Welcome to Love You a Brunch, the podcast for foodies and those who'd rather be brunching. Hi, I'm Jody Stapler. Today on Love You a Brunch, we will be speaking with Nick Sharma, culinary chef, food blogger, and cookbook author, who documents his love of food on his A Brown Table blog. He combines his Indian and American cultures to make culinary creations. He's the author of Season Cookbook and has been a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle. So stay with us after a word from our sponsors on Love You a Brunch. Willow Moon Publishing provides podcasting, print, ebook, and audiobook publishing services. We work to provide access to quality books that all too often are overlooked by the big five. Our goal is to help authors who tell engaging, dynamic, and compelling stories bring their work into the hands of readers. For more information about our books, our authors, our podcasts, or working with Willow Moon Publishing, please visit us at willowmoonpub.com. Want to impress all your family and friends at the next potluck or family gathering? Grab yourself the Sweet Treats Book of Cupcakes. Over 40 bakery recipes you can make at home with a mix. A Love You a Brunch cookbook. Available on Amazon or anywhere books are sold. We are talking with Nick Sharma from A Brown Table. And he is the author of the new cookbook, Season, Big Flavors, Beautiful Food. Hi, welcome. Hi, thanks for having me on today. Absolutely. Your book is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Yes, the pictures are gorgeous. And from what I understand, you actually took all those pictures, right? I, I did, yeah. I cook, style, photograph, wrote the whole book. You did it all. Yeah. Oh, It really is beautiful. There's a lot of movement in the pictures, so it's really a pleasure to go through and look at everything, the whole book. Thank you so much. So let's get started asking a little bit about you, about yourself. I read through all of your books, so I feel like I, I kind of got to know you. Um, But you're originally from India, is that right? That is correct. I grew up in a city called Bombay on the West Coast. Okay. I have been there. Oh. Um, Yeah, actually, that was my first trip out of the country. A friend of mine and I went out of nowhere, just decided, let's go to India and see a new culture. And we we stopped in Rajasthan first, second place, we went to Mumbai or Bombay. Uh And we went all around the country. So we we pretty much saw it all. And It's amazing. It is. The food is amazing. The people are amazing. It's it's such an amazing culture. Well, I'm so happy that was your first country outside. Yes, right? Nothing yeah. can live up to that now, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so you moved here to America at what age? I moved at around 20-ish. I was around 20 when I moved to a little after 20, I think. Okay. Yeah. Was it a huge culture shock? Um, not really, because I grew up in Bombay, which is a really large city. And then I had family that lived in America and also in Europe. Um, And then my mom's family lives in New Zealand. So I hadn't traveled a lot, but I still kind of knew what to expect in terms of culture. Mm -hmm. Um, And so language was also not a problem because I grew up speaking English. English is actually my first language. Okay. Um, And then... uh, in fact, um, French was the second language that I took in school because mm. my mom studied French. Um, and so I took that. But uh, language was never a problem. The food was never a problem because um, I also grew up eating um, meat, which I, I, I've heard is sometimes a problem for some people when they come from India, if they grew up vegetarian. Right. Um, uh, but it, yeah, I didn't have a culture shock. The only thing that was different for me was uh, Cincinnati was less populous as compared right. to uh, Bombay. <laughs> and so that was an interesting thing to see. Yeah, I bet that that was hard for us when we got there, because it doesn't matter where you're at. It's it's you're just back to back people. Yeah, that was, that's yeah, that I bet was a bit different for you. It definitely was. <laughs> <laughs> I read in your book that your mother was Catholic, your father was Hindu, so that's why I guess that you weren't vegetarian. Correct. Okay. And did you grow up eating like a mix of cultural foods or 
how did that work? Yeah, so like you said, like my mom's Roman Catholic and my dad's Hindu, so his food was very vegetarian. And there are Hindus that eat meat, don't get me wrong, there yeah. are. Um, a lot of them actually do um, uh, lamb more than mm -hmm. anything, or and some do seafood, depending on which part of the country you're from. But okay. um, my mom's family's on the West Coast, and it's a port they come from a Portuguese colony called Goa, so the food is very... Uh, Eurocentric ish, or rather influenced by your uh, and those flavors. So you'll see a lot of seafood because they lived on the coast, but you'd also see the use of pork, beef, um, and other kinds of meats. Okay. Um, and so what happened was when my parents got married, uh, they both cooked, and uh, on weekends and even during the week, you would have like each of them kind of bringing a dish to the table, so to speak. Not intentionally, but that's because what they knew. And then uh, what happened was also during the course of her marriage, my mom learned to cook a lot of the foods that my dad liked or would introduce her to. Right. And so then she would cook those dishes too. So you would have things that you normally wouldn't expect to see at everyone's houses in India, but you did here. And for me as a child, I always thought that was the norm. It was only until I started visiting um, like my other relatives as I got older and I started to pay attention of friends, um, you know, just to see how they did things in a very, uh, in a certain dimension that was very single dimension because that's what both their families came from. Okay, so you grew up around food and I read that your mother had lots of cookbooks and that you kind of saw the kitchen as kind of like your lab, your, your place to experiment. Yeah, so what would happen, um, both my parents worked and... My mom actually works and still does. She still works in hospitality management, but hates cooking, which is <laughs> why uh, I kind of stepped in a little bit as a child because she cooks well when she does, but I wanted something new. I want, you know, it's kind of cool when someone experiments and brings something new to you. Right. Most it's just the same old, same old. Yeah. And so I had seen her, she had this cabinet, where a wooden cabinet where she would keep all her recipes and a couple of cookbooks. She didn't collect a lot. Uh, and I think her intent was after she got married to kind of go through those and cook. It never really panned out that much. So I would go through those recipes and then start cooking as I got more comfortable in the kitchen. Um, and they were cool with it. They didn't really tell me no. Um, but it also felt like an experiment because at the same time, I was also developing a love for chemistry in school. And... The recipes, the way recipes are written are also the same way recipes for chemicals are written. It's the same way you write a procedure for an experiment. And so it just felt the same. I never thought twice. It just felt like, oh, these, it's like a similar protocol and that's it. Like, you know, yeah. Uh, and you make notes as you go on. And so it felt like I was experimenting. Like, you know, today something didn't work. So I could go back and do it again if I wanted to and do it in a different way. So now you said that you were into science. So you, you actually became a chemist? I studied uh, biochemistry in college. And then for grad school, I decided to go into molecular genetics. So it's a combination wow. of everything. Um, but yeah, that's what I majored in. Yeah. And that's what you came to America and, and, was, and was doing in the beginning. Is that right? Yeah, that's the research I was doing. I was studying um, two things. I was studying cancer. Okay. Uh, cancer research. And the second thing I was working on was herpes simplex. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, both important. Yeah, <laughs> just not as much. <laughs> not as much, but hey, you know, no one wants a cold sore. <laughs> right, right. Okay. okay, so when I went to Rajasthan, the, the area that I stayed in, their kitchens were very uh, rural, you know, open mm -hmm. fire. But back in Bombay, you had like a regular kitchen growing up and kind of but not really so one one thing about Bombay and this is something that I had to understand in terms of space mm -hmm. constraints it's such a large it's a large city it's larger it's a very large city but kind of like New York it's also built on seven islands if I remember correctly mm. it's a lot of reclaimed land so and everyone comes to Bombay to make a living so it's overcrowded so space is limited so houses are typically especially um well depending on what your income bracket is. My parents were not rich. So the kitchen was really small. And most kitchens back then did not come with an oven. An oven was not a standard kitchen appliance as it is here. Okay. Um, so there were people that had ovens. And another, what my mom would do when she had to bake 
cakes and desserts for Christmas and Easter, she would borrow this oven, which was kind of like a large metal, it's, I think it's called a camping oven, which you can put on a fire, on a gas fire. And the gas fire creates that cushion of hot air inside the oven and you can bake. Wow. Incredible. Uh, so it was something like that. Yeah. Um, and then eventually like the electric oven came in. So she got uh, like a, what is it called? Like a countertop um, electric oven. Okay. And grill, and that's what she used then eventually for most of her baking, and that's what I ended up using. Okay. Um, yeah. Wow. So now, are your parents still in India? My parents still live in Bombay. Okay. Yeah. And do they ever get over to visit? They do. They come. Uh, my dad hasn't visited uh, because they have a dog. He doesn't like to leave his pets. <laughs> So while the dog actually passed away a couple of months ago, but they don't like to leave their dog alone. Right. And so he usually stays with the dog. Now they've got cats also. Yeah, so it's, yeah. <laughs> uh, but my mom does. My mom comes with my sister occasionally. Um, and then we go. We've been, So what we've been doing for the past couple of years is alternating because they like to get out uh, too. So they come and visit or we go and visit them the other year. Oh, very nice. Okay. So you came here mm -hmm. and you met who's now your husband. Um, and he's from the South, the Appalachian Mountains of Virginia. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. my family comes from there as well. So I know that oh, really? the oh. Southern food <laughs> is, you know, there's, it's a definite difference between Indian food and Southern food, but you've managed to kind of meld them together. So it is, and there are a lot of differences, yeah. but there are also a lot of similarities that I've picked up on. Wow. Okay. Uh, yeah. So my first exposure to the South before I met my husband was New Orleans. Okay. My best friend um, was born and brought up in New Orleans. Her family still lives there. And so I actually go back often. We try to go back once a year. And um, New Orleans, the food, of course, is very different from the rest of the South. But it's also very flavorful mm. because in terms of the spices that they use. They don't shy away right. from flavor. And they're not... So they're not restrained and reserved in what they're willing to experiment with, which is why uh, it's also kind of the, like, I always think of it like the culinary capital of the South. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, and it's delicious. And uh, when I go there, I've seen a lot of the same spices. So what, the thing about New Orleans and this, a lot of the South is the history of slavery. A lot of the slaves that came brought these ingredients with them from the places that they were from. So a lot of them were from Africa, predominantly from Africa. And so Africa and India for the longest time also did trade on the side through mm -hmm. the centuries. So both countries have ingredients that have made their way back and forth. Right. Uh, and so it is cool. To, when I came to New Orleans, it was cool just to see these like okra, uh, you know, Indians eat okra. And I hadn't seen okra really being used in the Midwest or in the Northeast. Right. But when I came to New Orleans, it's a thing. Yeah. Um, you know, like shrimp, uh, things like shrimp. Uh, I feel Americans are still very particular about the seafood they eat. They will eat certain things, but they won't really eat eat all kinds of fish they're very particular yeah and so but if you go to the south because i think of the coastline and everything and uh, even on the east and west coast people are much more comfortable with seafood but it's still not as much as it's done in the south so i saw a lot of these similarities with the way things were being fed with the way things were being cooked uh to indian food and when i met my husband's family they live in the appalachian region um they're right on the border of virginia north carolina their food is different from new orleans yeah, so when I go to visit my mother-in-law, her food was different from New Orleans, obviously. But um, I noticed that she would do certain things that a lot of people in the South do. So like fried chicken, they do pies, cobblers were a big thing. Um, and then the other thing that she would do was, since they grew up on a, they own a farm, it's just enough to sustain a family or like one or two families. But they grew their own produce. And she was canning a lot. Right. Um, not that she needed to can anymore, but just by practice, because you grow, you don't want to waste. And so she would can for her family, uh, for her daughters, um, her son. And then also just to give the relatives that lived on the neighboring farms out there or friends and right. whatever. And then she also sells stuff. So it was like a thing. And I said, this is so interesting because my dad would uh, make Indian pickles, which I did not can usually, but it reminded me of that. And I said, you know, like habitually, some of these practices are just so common, uh, you know, regardless of where you live. So 
it's fascinating just to see people behave in the same but in a different way. And I said, okay, this is uh, something fun. Yeah. So you ended up going there and visiting. And by the time your first trip with them, you were cooking up a storm with your mother-in-law. Yeah. So what my husband did just strategically, we were dating back then. And he (laughs) introduced me to um, his mom via email. And we would text because he knew both of us love to cook a lot. I guess marry your mother in the end, essentially, is what he says now. (laughs) Uh, he, la- he always like tells me, oh my God, I feel like I married my mom. <laughs> um, but when I came, she said, hey, so, you know, he said, yeah, I think you should cook for them. So I said, well, I kind of know based on what you like, your guys are a meat and potato family. So um, let's, you know, do that. So I said, yeah, let me see what I can pull together. So I knew that they like meat and potatoes. Um And so the first time I went there, I decided to cook something that I knew that I was pretty confident for, you know, you're going out there, you don't know what they like. And so I said, uh, let me do this. uh, Let me do a biryani. So I did a chicken biryani. I didn't do beef in the chicken. Uh, I did chicken instead because I knew chicken is usually a crowd pleaser with most people. And then, uh, you know, biryani, some versions of biryani use fried potatoes. So I said, okay, fried potatoes are going in. I know they like that. And so it was an easy one pot dish that I made and very flavorful. And then I did on the side, I did um, just a plain yogurt writer with uh, cucumber and I think onions. Okay. And that was it. They loved it. And so she wanted me to cook again that week. And I said, oh gosh, you know, Michael wants me to make beef. He keeps, he loves beef. So he wants me to cook beef. So they have, they raise their own cows. And so they always have meat once the cows are, you know, taken, uh, slaughtered and they take the meat, all the parts are frozen and the family uses it for the year round. So she thawed out a lot of beef and I said, oh gosh, like this is not even my kitchen. I don't know what to do. Um, So I don't want to make steak for anybody because I don't know how things are going to work. So I went with a dish that I grew up with in India called chili fry. Mm. And what they do is they take the beef. It's a go-on dish. They take the beef, they season it. And then it's basically stir fried with a lot of peppers and chilies and onions and seasoned well. And I said, I'm going to serve this. And then my mother-in-law makes a sourdough bread. It's not like the sourdough that's sold on the West Coast. It's much more softer, sweeter. Uh, She uses potato flakes to kind of feed the culture. So it's different. And that's what we ate it with. And it was a hit. And then she said, um, I guess also what happened was she was getting a break from having to cook for everyone. So she was really (laughs) enjoying her time away. And then she said, oh, let's make a cobbler. So we went to the farm outside and they've got wild berries that grow out there. So we just grabbed a bunch of berries and came in and made a cobbler together, which is the first time I made a cobbler. And I said, oh, I like this. It's kind of like a deconstructed pie. Yeah. Um, And it's easy to put together. So that's the first time I actually ended up cooking with her. So so Uh, you you decided, you guys, at at one point, you decide that the career in science is not what you want to do anymore. How did that come about? So I had started the blog when I lived in DC. um, And I was, even when I lived in Cincinnati, I was entertaining and cooking friends who wanted to know more about Indian food. uh, But I also like cooking my own thing. And so I, you know, that was a way of also for me to experiment with people and feed them food. And the other thing was that we didn't mention this earlier, but when I lived in India, I wanted to go to culinary school. My mom said no, because it's not a life she thought I could handle. Mm. Um, and so when I came to DC, uh, Michael and I met, we were living together and then I was cooking a lot. Every big celebration would happen at our place. So for our friends that couldn't go away for Thanksgiving, this now became like the spot for a Thanksgiving dinner. Okay. And, uh, which was weird because I hadn't grown up doing celebrating Thanksgiving, but right. here I was cooking, uh, Thanksgiving. Um, and so it was fun. And so we would do Christmas, Thanksgiving, whenever we were in town and our friends needed to come over, we did, we hosted Um, and so we would do that. And so that's how the blog started. And then Michael wanted to leave. He was in defense for the longest time. He had worked in the air force, um, you know, in the military had done his time, then worked as a consultant, just wanted to get away from politics and defense. He was done. And so he decided to change careers and we moved to California. Uh, when we moved to California, which is when I was still working in a pharmaceutical company and Michael, uh, you know, I told him one day, I said, I kind of want to do what you did, like switch careers because you know, I'm having fun with the blog. I enjoy what I'm doing, but I want to take it to the next level. 
And he said, okay, I'll support you. Uh, go and figure out what you want to do, if you want to go to culinary school or not. So I said, let's go and do interviews. So I did interviews at culinary schools. But then the loan scared me. Mm. Um, I had never taken a school loan before, and I knew that the risk in um, cooking is too high. Yeah. Not everyone's going to end up, you know, famous or be right. on TV or have a slew of restaurants to their name. So I said, why not go work in a kitchen and get the experience first? So at the time, I wanted to be a pastry cook. So I went and worked at a, I called up a bunch of places. One person called me back and I went and worked at a patisserie um, in South Bay in Santa Clara. I worked there for about a year and a half, got a lot of experience. And at that point, I said, I don't think I want to go to work in a kitchen anymore because I see myself writing more about food and culture. Mm. And that's when um, I started, I got a job in San Francisco as a food photographer. So at a food startup and we bought a place in Oakland, which is where I live now. So we moved to Oakland. I left the pastry shop and was working as a food photographer. At the same time, the book deal happened. And um, also, I got offered to write a column for the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, and so those all those things kind of happened at the same time. It goes to show you when you're doing something that you love, it all comes into place. It does. And yeah. I really enjoy what I do. Yeah. So let's talk about your book a little bit. I'm looking at it here. I love the beginning where you're explaining the different spices and the different flavors with the pictures. It makes it so much easier for someone who's going to go to a store to get those and who's never bought them before. So one of the things I wanted to do with the book was when you open it, like you said, it opens into this flavor glossary. It's very visual. You have close up photos of telling you that, Hey, this is what you should. Um, this is how it looks. Because I think one of the things that even when I started to cook, I was very uncomfortable going into stores and asking for help. Right. Cause it makes you sound like, honestly, it makes you feel like a fool. Yeah, it does. <laughs> I'm you not know? Mincing, yeah. I'm not <laughs> missing words. And right. I think, I think I felt that since this was a book um, that is about the experience of flavor for a home cook you know not all home cooks and even I don't know a lot of things like even when I started to cook I said the best thing for me to do was to have a visual guide by photos because illustrations are fine but even illustrations don't really give you the real life look right of what it is and so things like cumin and um cumin anise and fennel, they all look the same. If you don't put them together, they look the same. But when you bring them together, they look very different. Unless you grew up using them, you won't have any comparative endpoint. And so I said, let's put all of these together. And I'm going to sort them out by taste. And then whatever doesn't fit by taste, I'm going to put them into, say, aroma. So there's a section for florals. Um, so people kind of know. And that way, when you go to the store, you don't really have to ask anyone for help. You can kind of, If you have the book with you, you can kind of take a peek quickly and then look for it. Uh, so I just kind of want to make things easier for home cooks. So you feel more confident, not only in the kitchen, but also at grocery stores. Absolutely. Um, and also in the back of the book, you actually put um, in different locations where they can get some of these things, which is I great. did. Yeah, I feel uh, when I've lived now in different parts of the country, one of the first things that I have to do is to find out where certain stores are. Is it the, you know, like the Indian store, the Iranian store, or the, you know, the Chinese markets, the Korean markets. So I figured that since this is a book and it's more about India and America, let me mention the stores that I've been to in different parts of the country, but also try and focus on like the north, south, east, west. So at least you know, people have some place that they can go to. And many of these places, you can order the spices online from these okay. places and they'll ship it to you. Now, what about the ones that are like leaves? Like you have the curry leaves mm -hmm. and um, let's see here. Where can you, I mean, you don't, you recommend not to have those dried. Is that right? Yeah. So I've tried doing that and I've also used store-bought dried. It just does not taste the same, especially with curry leaves. It's one ingredient that you should use fresh. And this is what I tell people. So it's not possible to everyone to grow the plant. I grow one in California. We grow it outside. Uh, but the weather is uh, cool for the most part of the year where I live. So it doesn't grow as well as it does in the south. If you're mm -hmm. living in the south, you can grow curry plants pretty much anywhere as long as you have heat and humidity. Um, often I've, the Indian friends that I have that I've gone and visited in the south have buckets of curry leaves growing in their backyards because mm -hmm. it, it takes over. Um, 
But if you live in New York, you could grow it outdoors in summer and in a pot and then bring it indoors in winter. Okay. And one way to achieve humidity in winter is to spray it with a water bottle. Okay. Now, um, if, if, they do, if you don't have the curry leaf, mm-hmm. what can you use as a substitute in like sure. your recipe for the curry leaf popcorn chicken? So there is no substitute. And I, I oh. always love having a substitute, but there isn't. But this is what I tell people. Regardless of where you live in America, I feel there's an Indian restaurant now everywhere. Mm. Ask the Indian restaurant. Reach out to them. Good idea. More so than often, they will tell you where they source their ingredients from. And this is something you should do for any culture that you're trying to learn about in terms of food. And this is what I do. I reach out and say, hey, I'm looking for this ingredient. Can you help me out and tell me where I can find some? More often, they will tell you where the source is um, and give you a contact. Uh, the second thing that they probably will do, and this happens, you probably need a really small quantity, right? Mm-hmm. They'll probably just give it, give you some. Right. Uh, yeah, because, I'm sure they're very happy to to kind of share their culture even more. Yeah, and it's a great way to build a conversation with people. So yeah. I actually encourage people who are looking for something like a curry leaf that there is no substitute for, uh, go and ask them. Go and ask an Indian restaurant. Uh, that's close to you and ask them what do they do and they'll tell you yeah that's a great idea you know I honestly would not have thought to do that but that is honestly a great idea that is something to keep in mind for sure okay so I'm looking through the book and there are so many great recipes and honestly it makes me hungry to look at it what is your favorite recipe? <laughs> They're all my favorites. It's like asking. <laughs> right, I know. Which one's your favorite child? Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, you know, I want people to cook whatever they're comfortable with. Start small. And then, you know, once you get more comfortable or if you have, a, you know, like a more advanced skill set, jump in and, you know, do something that requires a few more steps. But usually the, uh, the way that I design the recipes in the book, it's comfortable for everyone, but it's also a book where it doesn't require a lot of effort because I also am a lazy home cook and I know how hard it is sometimes just to put something together uh, for a meal and I want things to be quick. So quick. I love that. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> I feel like you require patience in the kitchen. So not all recipes will happen overnight. Like there's the dessert uh, called a bibinka, which is made with sweet potatoes. You bake it the night before and you have to okay. let it sit in the fridge if you want a good cut because it's still it's still tender when it comes out of the oven. It's an egg custard. Okay. And once you let it sit in the fridge, it cools down and it firms up. You can slice it well. It's not gooey and which is what you want. So there's certain things I think you shouldn't compromise on, like sometimes even a marinade. Um, Depending on the recipe, you could, I always tell people, keep it at least for a minimum of two to four hours. Um, But, you know, overnight, I prefer overnight. That's what most Indian people do. Mm -hmm. Um, And then like something for like red meat, 20 minutes, just season it for 20 minutes, wrap it up, but let it sit. Just give it that little bit of time for the meat. Uh, You know, even with vegetables, I also recommend seasoning and letting them sit for a few minutes before you actually expose them to heat or you know the cooking process yeah or even a salad because it really helps the ingredients in there to absorb those flavors okay you want to give those chemical reactions a chance to take place right okay so now would you say that for instance um like soups and stews and especially the ones in here would taste better the second day or is that not in, in so in general um i feel anything that has a large amount of acid tastes better after a couple of days okay because acids like vinegar uh they tend like lime juice lemon juice they help to break down things they help to they just change everything because they start to interact and react with the other essential oils that are coming from the spices and it just tastes better but um a lot of the soups in the book you can eat them the day off and they're Mm -hmm. fine uh but some things it's true that some things especially soups stews uh Anything that I feel like that's a liquid base tastes better the next day. Mm-hmm. So uh, with these recipes, are there any that you really like pulled out of your childhood or like was a favorite that you kind of tweaked? Yeah. Or are these all brand new you created? So 85 to 95% of the book, a lot of that is just new stuff that I had never written about or I created mm-hmm. specifically for the book. Okay. Um, and then there are recipes that I grew up in my childhood that I've tweaked for the book. 
uh, mm-hmm. that I really wanted to write about because I hadn't seen them written elsewhere. Right. And uh, like the potato chops, there's a, it's, I call it a dumpling. Mm-hmm. It's basically mashed potatoes that are seasoned with salt. And then you have ground lamb. You could use beef. You could use ground tofu. Uh, if you're using tofu, I recommend using a bit of um, vegan sausage to okay. kind of build that meaty, to increase the meatiness um, and the flavor. And then you have that cooked. So you make a little dumpling with the mashed potatoes. You fill it up with a little a spoonful or two of the meat. Seal the dumpling to form a cake. And then dip it in a bit of egg or do an egg wash and then uh, breadcrumbs. And then sear it on a pan and it's done. That's something that I grew up with. I've changed the flavors quite a bit. I'm using sambal olek, which is a fermented uh, chili garlic paste. Mm-hmm. It's used in a lot of uh, Thai cooking um, and then uh, there's a sweet potato bibinka that I mentioned earlier. That's something that I, my grandmother would make using potatoes. I've used sweet potatoes to kind of bring it into a much more fall Thanksgiving kind of. Yeah. For the folks that don't want to make a pie, this is a really good dish to try out. Right. Okay. That would be perfect for the Thanksgiving season coming up. Yeah. And then um, little things like the dates, uh, like the grilled dates with oh, um, right. and raisins with black pepper. That's something that I grew up with. I didn't tweak it too much, but what I do recommend is um, adding salt and then using it over your, you know, with granola or plain yogurt. Um, so yeah, that was, it was fun. Uh, like yeah. there's a recipe for a savory granola and I grew up eating this potato chip that was seasoned in the same way. And I said, let me do a savory granola that's based on that tomato taste. So I use uh, tomato powder in that. Okay. Yeah. Those, uh, raisins and dates look amazing. I've never thought to eat them like that before, but it definitely is something I'm going to try. It's so easy. Yeah, it just seems like it would be so delicious with caramelizing the sugars inside and everything. Coming up, Nick Sharma discusses more recipes from his cookbook, like garam masala and chai tea, and also some great turkey recipes that are perfect for Thanksgiving, and what he'll be doing for Thanksgiving this year. So stay with us after these sponsor messages. Samuel Stanley Scotty Snipe would not brush his teeth at night. He'd wash his face and comb his hair, but for clean white teeth, he did not care. Samuel Stanley Scotty Snipe is a book written by Allison T. Broderick. It's about a boy that doesn't like to brush his teeth, and consequences soon follow. It's got cool rhymes and great pictures. It's available at Amazon and anywhere that books are sold. Did you know you could find Love You A Brunch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube? Please check us out, follow, and subscribe. Also, if you'd like to ask a question or share a story, Skype us at Love You A Brunch. Or visit us at our website, loveyouabrunchpodcast.com. Or you can email me at loveyouabrunchpodcast at gmail.com. So I have to ask you, why mm-hmm. does the chai tea taste so much better in India? <laughs> so, so we don't follow the rule in India where, you know, like you boil the water, then you add the tea leaves then you let it steep. Yeah. I've actually rarely seen Indians do that. Uh, it's boiled. It's over boiled. It's over. <laughs> so what they do is it's usually, um, dep- Typically, you'll see half and half. So you'll see water and milk boiled together, and then the tea leaves are added in okay. um, and cooked. Uh, and then they, of course, add a sweetener. That's the basic chai recipe. And then when they add masala to it, which is a spice mix, okay. they add, uh, like my mom usually just adds ginger and calls it a ginger or cardamom and uh, green cardamom, and that's it. But there, and sometimes she'll go out of her way and then grind and add a few more spices in. So some people grind cinnamon, or star anise, in addition to all the ginger and cardamom. Black pepper is used, and it builds a much more richer flavor. So that's masala chai. Okay, and you have that in the cookbook as well. I did, and I wrote the recipe so that people have freedom to add whatever kind of sweeteners they want, whatever kind of milks that they like, because just based on my family's experience I know not all of them have chai the same way yeah and so I said let me do it in that sense so that people have the freedom because I didn't want it to come across as this is such an I hate the word authentic or traditional right um and so I said let me do it the way practically that my family does it yeah 
And so it's convenient for people to take that recipe and then make it the way they want to. Right. Perfect. I, everywhere we went in India, we were offered chai. And I have not been able to find anything that tasted as good as it did in India anywhere in America. And I look all the time. It might be the tea leaves. Okay. Yeah, check out where you're getting your tea leaves from here. Okay. Um, but usually, I usually buy the Assam or Darjeeling tea leaves okay. for most of my tea. Uh, but it's I, it's also just boiling it longer, which makes it much more bitter and richer, which is why they add the milk. Yeah. The milk cuts through the tannins, the bitterness of the tannins. Right. Okay. I will try that. Uh, bringing up, you said bitter, so it reminded me of the five flavor profiles. Now, we know salty, sour, sweet, bitter. Can you describe umami for those who don't know? Of course. So umami is not, it's basically it's savoriness. It's something that you experience when you have monosodium glutamate, which is in tomatoes, um, you know, um, meat. It's that meatiness quality, that taste that you get. It's basically an amino acid that's touching the receptors on your tongue, in your mouth, and giving that sensation of meatiness. And um, it's not really a flavor that's explored in Indian cuisine, but it is in Asian cuisine. You'll see a lot in Japanese. That's where the word comes mm -hmm. from. You'll see it in Chinese food also being explored in their own way. Korean food does that too. Um, and so it's become a flavor that's now, con it wasn't a flavor for the longest time, and now it's considered a flavor in the West. Mm -hmm. um, it was always on the east, though. Right. Um, and then um, what I try to do with umami is, especially in dishes where I know it's a flavor that's easily lost, too. Because in Indian cooking, we look for an explosion of flavors. And I feel sometimes those spices, even if they might amplify the umaminess in a dish, you might not taste it because the other spices can be a pretty um, contra the there can be contradictions in the way they're put. Mm -hmm. And so you don't really sense that umami. So I try to play with that a little bit. I use ingredients like mushrooms. Mushrooms are a great way, dried mushrooms especially. If you're trying to make a vegetarian stock, uh, add dried mushroom powder. It will increase the umaminess. Okay. Uh, use uh, coffee. There's a tea called Lapsang Suchang, which I use in the book to make a, like a broth. And I put butternut squash ribbons in it. Uh, Lapsang uh, Suchang is a tea that's it's a black tea that is the way it's smoked and dried builds that umami note in the broth. Okay. Uh, cocoa, unsweetened cocoa powder, mm -hmm. that's an umami agent because again it builds on meatiness. So I usually use it when I'm making a bean stew. The Mexicans use it in mole. Um, you got also uh, coffee. Coffee beans, you know, you can add that to, again, when making broths and soups, add a little bit. It will increase the umaminess. Mm. You'll also see people adding coffee and cocoa to chili right. in the Midwest. Yeah. Um, you'll see that there. And they've been doing it for so long, not really knowing whether it's umami or not, yeah. but because it builds on that flavor. And so you don't have to add meat to a dish. You can actually just use these ingredients and play with it. Soy sauce is another common ingredient Um that has that umami quality. Okay. And then, like I mentioned earlier, tomatoes. Mm -hmm. Tomatoes are one of the richest sources of monosodium glutamate, which is what umami essentially is. Right. Well, I think that monosodium, yeah, I'm not even going to say it. MSG, uh, back in the 80s, really got a bad rap. And people right. hear that and all of a sudden, you know, get really mm -hmm. put off by anything that they think has MSG in it. Yeah, and they shouldn't because MSG is also like a natural component of your blood. You have at all times your body does glutamic. It, it's it's the salt of glutamic acid, yeah. which is an essential amino acid in your body. Um, like actually, may, I may be wrong. It might be essential or non-essential, but it is a part of your bloodstream. And it's always there at all times. So MSG really doesn't do anything for you except for that taste. Yeah. You have a bunch of turkey recipes in here, so that's perfect for November. Yeah, I um, actually find turkey to be less flavorful than chicken. So I said, you know what, if I, I have to put turkey, I'm going to put some turkey recipes in the book and I'm going to do it my way. Mm -hmm. So I, um, you know, there's a citrus recipe where you can basically throw in any kind of citrus and then there's a little bit of cayenne and you stick it in the oven. So you've got this very citrus winter kind of flavorful turkey meat. Um, the other recipe is the little hand pies. Okay, yes. Those were a childhood favorite, but we did it with chicken or beef okay. or lamb, um, actually mutton, not lamb. 
And um, I did my own version with turkey in the book. That's a really fun way to play it. I think it's a good uh, appetizer mm -hmm. for the holidays. Yeah. It's all you need is to get is puff pastry and then cook the meat separately, put it together and bake. Now, if you ha like, for instance, I have a, a child who's a vegetarian. So what could okay. I, what could I replace the turkey with? So go and buy ground tofu. Okay. Um, and they also sell tofu sausage. Mm -hmm. I tell people to use a mix of both because the sausage has already got those spices in it so that you don't have to figure out the seasonings for this. You can use the same seasonings with tofu, but I find the sausage adds that extra depth of meatiness that someone who has given up meat is looking for. Okay. Perfect. I look forward to trying some of these for sure. This turkey with cherry fennel barbecue sauce sounds amazing. That's a good spring to summer recipe. Yeah. Perfect. So which one is your husband's favorite recipe in this cookbook? Or has he not told you? <laughs> he, so when I got my first advanced copy, he took the book uh, quickly. And then I saw he had made notes in the like post-it notes. Oh. And I said, why are there post-it notes in this book? And he said, that's because <laughs> these are the recipes I haven't tasted. And they're in the book. And I'm really surprised. I'm really upset. Oh. So I said, no, you've tasted all of these recipes. Because especially the meat ones, I've never run them by you. Um, and he claims no. I think he just wants another go at them. Um, <laughs> but he likes the steak with the orange peel and coriander. Okay. He's made the fried olives himself. Ooh, yeah. Um, the ones with the garam masala, the ones that I've yeah. made. And then the other recipe he did most recently was the okra, the fried okra. Um, mm -hmm. He likes fried, as you can tell. Yeah, well, he's from the South. Right. Um <laughs> Let's see. And the other dish that he did was the grilled peas uh, with fennel. Okay. Because he likes to grill. Yeah. Awesome. Very wonderful. So, okay, there was something else I'm trying to find. There was another little small bite that you had that was close to the, oh, the Brussels sprouts. Maybe. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's what I want to try. I love Brussels sprouts. I eat them almost every single day, and this looks delicious. And it, you don't need bacon. I felt like the longest time. But so Brussels sprouts is not something that I grew up with eating in India. And when I yeah. came here, the only most restaurants would serve Brussels sprouts with bacon or pancetta. And it yeah. is delicious. I get it. Like, I love it. But I didn't see anything beyond that. And or they were um, overly charred with maple syrup or something. And I kind of wanted to do something. How would like I kept thinking, how would like my grandmother cook this dish if she would like if this was a competition and they gave her Brussels sprouts, what would she do? And so I said, OK, I think this is kind of what she might do. A little bit of coconut oil just for that tropical nuttiness. And yeah. I said, OK, you know what? This actually tastes really good. And for the vegetarians and vegans that don't want to use bacon, um, this is like a recipe that I think they would like. Right. I love that you thought, what would my grandmother do? I love that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so oh, I did, I want to ask you a question about the um, food grade mustard oil. And I, I read mm -hmm. in here that you say that's not available here in America. Why is, why don't they allow that here? So I actually recently found out that there is a brand that is available. I wrote, I wrote about oh. this at the, in my column uh, this okay. after the book was done. But uh, right. so mustard oil comes from the Rafano Brassica family, which is where we get our rapeseed oil. And mm -hmm. a lot of people, I, I was surprised, um, and I learned this too, was that canola comes from the same family. Canola is an oil that we all use. It stands for Canada oil because it's from the rapeseed family, and it was bred to reduce a chemical called uricic acid. Mm. Uricic acid has been shown in animal studies to cause heart disease, but there is no evidence in humans but because you ethically cannot administer a chemical like that to someone or have them consume something which you know will be in the worst interest, right. right? So ethically, you can't do that study. So all the data is extrapolated based on population studies, which are very difficult to tease apart. There's no way you can say that this caused it. Um, because people do a lot of other things besides just eat that one thing you tell them to eat. Um, yeah. So... Mustard oil comes from the same family and has a very high concentration of this chemical called uricic acid. And because of that, although it's used in India and in some parts of Southeast Asia, in America and in other parts of the West, the consumption of the oil for edible purposes is legally banned. And okay. you can find it at stores, but they'll say to use it 
for external purposes only. I've heard a lot of writers uh, from India argue that, well, if Indians have been doing this for so long and they don't have heart disease, right? you know, why is it a problem? That's actually not the case. It's used in West... And I, so when I was researching this story, I looked at medical studies also just to kind of get an idea of incidence of heart disease. Um, and I'm not making any claims per se. I'm just saying what I've observed in studies is that mm -hmm. in parts of the country where it is used, there is a high incidence of heart disease. No one has actually said, okay, it is due to this because they can't make that claim. Right. Um, and the other thing to remember, in a lot of parts where it's used, they're on the coastline, so they eat a lot of seafood, a lot of fish. Fish contains essential uh, fatty acids that actually counteract inflammation of the heart tissue and muscle. And um, those are some things to keep in mind. Even it's a, a common mistake that a lot of people now tell coconut oil is the healthiest thing ever. It's not. It is saturated oil. But if you look to countries where you're claiming that it's, you know, caused a lot of great health effects, they're always on the coastline because that's where coconuts are grown. And so people who are consuming coconut in their diet, and I did that too growing up in Bombay and Goa, but we eat a large amount of fresh fish all the time. Mm -hmm. And that's those essential fatty acids are known to prevent inflammation of heart tissue and you know lead to better health outcomes so it's you're trying to there are many things that are happening here and you're trying to mix them together and ignore one part just because it sounds better it's not right to do that scientifically so mustard oil is not used but i found recently that there's a company a farm in australia and the brand is called yandilla one. Okay, And they have bred a strain of mustard that still has that wasabi-like taste in mm -hmm. the oil. Uh, that's what it's known for, that pungency. And it's a very low saturated fatty acid. So it's great for cooking. Perfect. Um, and what was the name again? Yandilla. Y-A-N-D-I-L-L-A. -L -L -A. Okay. I'll have to look for that. And it's available. I found it in a store in Berkeley called Market Hall. That's where I now get it from. Um, okay. And so you can use, the government has allowed that for sale for edible purposes. Okay. Yeah. Great. Okay, so there's some other um, different things in here that, you know, here in America we're not used to using, but we hear it all the time. Garam masala uh -huh. is one of the seasonings that we hear about all the time, but maybe don't know what's in it. So garam masala is basically stands for warm spices. Uh, okay. It's a mixture of spices. There are a couple of things like green cardamom that's added in there to kind of balance the heat from the other ingredients. And if you'll notice garam masala, it also it also varies quite a bit from household to household. This is the version that I make in my house. But feel free to like change the ratios to suit what you like it to be. Mm. Uh, because they do that in India too. If you go to the south, you'll notice that the flavors are much more warmer. You'll see more cinnamon, um, you know, to build on that heat. And then if you go to the north, especially towards the Pakistan side of the country, you'll see uh, a lot more people using cardamom, green cardamom, to build on the aroma because they prefer aroma mm -hmm. in their food. And so make it your own. It's a recipe that's easily tweaked. Uh, just change the ratios. But it's an all-purpose seasoning uh, that you can use in savory dishes from meats to vegetables. Okay. What are your plans for Thanksgiving and the holidays? Will you be cooking for everybody? So this year for Thanksgiving, we're actually doing something different. We're visiting my in-laws the week after. So everyone, because my uh, both my sister-in-laws always have to be on call during Thanksgiving. Um, mm. So we really don't get to spine, spend a lot of time with them. But this year, after the holidays, it's oh, they get a week off. So we said, why haven't we done this before? So this year, we're going to go spend a week out at the farm um and just i guess i'll be cooking um i don't do the turkey usually yeah i leave that to my father-in-law okay and he's happy to do it yeah wow that's great so now will you be making anything um that has a little bit of an indian flavor to it for your thanksgiving they do want me to make ice cream this year that's been like a request even for my nephews so okay like the jaggery ice cream they so one wanted a chocolate. Okay. Um. So I got to do a chocolate. I feel like chocolate is uh, kids love chocolate. So I got to right. do a chocolate, and then there was a request for a lemon ice cream from Ooh. from someone I don't remember who, but I got to do a lemon ice cream. Um. So yeah. 
Wow. It's going to be busy. I wish you were in my family. I could make you make that for <laughs> me. <laughs> I would, I would. <laughs> well, great. Thank you so much, Nick. And please go get Nick's book, Nick Sharma from A Brown Table. And his book is Season. And it is a beautiful book. It is great for the home cook and for anybody who wants to try anything new. Get out of your comfort zone. Go try something new. Thank you. Thank you. And it was great talking to you. Likewise. Bye-bye. I want to thank Nick Sharma for speaking with me today. Make sure you check out his website, abrowntable.com, and his new cookbook, Season. Big flavors, beautiful food. And thank you for joining us today. If you enjoy listening to my podcast, please subscribe, leave me a review, and join us on our Facebook page, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Or email me at loveyouabrunchpodcast at gmail.com. Join us again next week. I'm Jody Stapler, and love you a brunch.